Hey guys, Mr. Hyatt here. This is the AP Environmental Science Chapter 2 lecture. Um, right off the bat, make sure that you are uh, spending time this chapter on the case studies and really throughout the whole book. Uh, so much of AP uh, is revolving or does revolve around taking the ideas that we're learning and applying them to the real world. And the case studies are going to be huge for helping us make those connections taking things out of academia and applying them to the real world. So make sure you've skimmed section one. At this point in your educational careers, you should understand the scientific method and the scientific process. You should also understand that rarely in the real world do things follow the step-by-step-by-step -step -step process that you may be learned in elementary or middle school, where we make a hypothesis and we make observations, we ask a question, we collect data. It, it just doesn't all happen in that nice, neat, order that, that we sometimes teach our younger students. So remember that you're always doing all parts of the scientific process when you're doing research. A lot of this chapter is going to be review uh, of things that you learned in Chem 1. Uh, so atomic structure is huge in chemistry, so hopefully you're, you're comfortable with this if you've had chemistry. If you haven't, then you might have to play a bit of catch up. Um, but we know that protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. The electrons buzz around in the electron cloud. Uh, we know that the atomic number is the number of protons. You can't change the number of protons without changing the element. You can change the number of neutron, neutrons that give you a different version of that element, and that's called an isotope. Another uh, different version of an atom, uh, of course, is an ion. So that's going to be a charged different version uh, of the element and hopefully you know lots about chemical reactions and, and how valence electrons interact and all those types of things. Next up on the review train is the pH scale. Remember that it's our method of measuring acidity. So when we talk about acid rain and acid snow and things like that, you should have a good idea of what the pH that we're talking about, uh, what that pH is. Uh, same thing when we talk about basic items. So of course, you know, 7 is neutral, 0 is super strong, 14 is, is super a super strong base. So uh, if you're not familiar with that, again, read, read closely. Organic compounds are, are going to be anything based in carbon, uh, anything that's mostly carbon. Uh, and in environmental science, we sometimes loosely refer to anything involved with life as organic doesn't quite fit the definition that you would learn in chemistry, but kind of does. Um, still carbon-based, still mostly carbon molecules, but uh, essentially anything that, that is involved in life, we tend to call organic here in environmental science. And things that are not involved with life or, or not directly involved with life, we call inorganic. <clears throat> uh, again, a review from chemistry talking about changes in matter. Uh, a physical change is going to be where you freeze something or you melt it or you evaporate it, but you're not changing the chemical structure or the chemical chemical composition. Uh, chemical reaction, chemical change, you're going to change things. You're going to have reactants, you're going to have products. What comes out is not going to be necessarily the same as what goes in. A uh, third type of change that we could have is a nuclear change. We could have radioactive decay where uh, particles from the nucleus escape and the atom decays and breaks down slightly. Um, radioisotopes, you probably learned about those <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, Biology 1 when you talked about carbon dating. Um, we'll talk a lot about fission and fusion as we move throughout the year. Just know for now that fission is splitting, fusion is combining. Law of conservation of matter, uh, everyone should know this. We can't create anything new. We can only rearrange the things that exist. Energy has a lot of forms. This should hopefully be reviewed. Kinetic energy, that's the energy of motion. Potential energy is stored up energy that could be turned into kinetic energy. Heat is transferred by radiation, conduction, and convection, so that's a specific type of uh, energy. And electromagnetic radiation, again, uh, is a different type of, uh, of energy, typically a, a type of kinetic energy. So uh, in, in our first chapter, we talked about our dependence upon solar energy. And, and again, that doesn't necessarily mean solar panels and solar cells. It could mean the fact that the sun provides 99% of Earth's energy. Whether we're talking about photosynthesis, whether we're talking about 
the ability to support the food web that then supports uh, organisms dying and being uh, preserved and, and breaking down and, and turning into fossil fuels. Somehow, some way, all of that energy starts with the sun. Even the coal that we burn to power the lights started with the sun. Without the sun, we wouldn't have any of the energy that we have here on Earth. Energy changes are governed by these two major scientific laws. First law of uh, thermodynamics is uh, essentially the law of conservation of energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed in physical and chemical changes. We can convert energy from one form to another, but we can't create it. Uh, second law of thermodynamics is uh, what you might have called entropy in uh, chemistry. It's the fact that at, with every energy conversion, the energy becomes less efficient and becomes less usable. Um, think about uh, the light bulb example that's on the screen here. Combustion engine, same exact thing. You're producing energy to, uh, to help you see, but your light bulb gets hot. If you've ever tried to change a light bulb uh, that, that wasn't burnt out, it was just dimming, you, you know that it, it gets hot. Uh, that's the whole premise behind the old Easy Bake Oven. Combustion engine, same deal. You drive around for hours and hours. It doesn't matter if it's the dead of winter. Your hood is warm. You're, you're wasting a lot of heat in that energy transfer. This is a huge idea uh, in environmental science, the idea of a system. So what is your system? We're going to mostly uh, look at the Earth as our closed system. It's just a set of components that interact in a regular way. We could have a system within a system. If you think about the human body, we have circulatory systems and, and digestive systems, all these different systems within the human body. Each of those could be considered a system, and the overall body could be a system, and the earth could be a system. One that we'll look at a lot in this class is the economy. It's a system. It's a set of components that just behave in a regular way. It's a very nebulous definition, um, but it's important to keep in mind, what is my system? What am I talking about? Uh, if we're talking about uh, the law of conservation of matter, we're talking about our system being the earth. If we're talking about the law of conservation of energy, we're talking about our system being the universe. Um, so just some terms that deal uh, or relate to uh, systems. Inputs are going to be things that come into the system. Flows and throughputs are going to be things that go through the system. And then outputs are going to be things that come out of the system into the surrounding area. And here's kind of a, uh, an example of that. Uh, think about uh, sunlight comes in. We do something through photosynthesis, and we create sugar and oxygen. So things come in, some stuff happens, and things go out. This idea of positive and negative feedback loops is another really big one uh, here in AP Environmental, and it's one that's tested over really heavily. Um, so a positive feedback loop, uh, it's called positive because you affect positive change. Whatever uh, change is happening, it's going to cause the change to continue or to, to amplify. Um, I, I sort of use the example of um, creating leaders in your classroom community. You get one student that's acting the way that they should and, and doing the things that they should, and that encourages other students to act the way they should and encourage, uh, I'm sorry, and, and do the things that they should. So it builds off of itself. The flip side of that is a negative feedback loop where something happens and it causes something else to stop. Um, so your book's going to use a, a thermostat example. But let's look at some, some specific examples from your book. Um, here's a positive feedback loop. So uh, decreasing vegetation causes erosion, the erosion causes more vegetation to die, and it just continues to spiral. Now notice, this is a positive feedback loop, not a positive result. So positive feedback loops can cause negative results, so don't, don't let that trip you up. We tear down trees, so that causes erosion, which causes more trees to die, so the problem just gets worse and worse and worse. Negative feedback uh, would be your thermostat in your house. I, I started to talk about this earlier and decided to wait till we got to the pictures. So you set your thermostat. Here we've got it set at 68. We'll start over here. Thermostat's set at 68. Uh, but it's 70 degrees, so the house is going to cool off. As soon as it hits 70, or I'm sorry, it's 70, the house is going to cool off. 
until it hits 68. Then the AC is going to turn off. AC turns off, gradually your house warms up. Once it gets above 68, in this case 70, uh, it, it's going to kick on again and cool it off. So you can see that's an example of a negative feedback loop. Something changes that causes something to stop. So in negative feedback loops, we see a tipping point or a threshold that causes that shift in behavior. Um, some examples, uh, melting of the polar ice and population growth, those both have tipping points. What is the tipping point? We're not quite sure yet. But eventually, all the polar ice melts, really bad things happen. Well, what if only three-fourths of the ice melts? Do those bad things still happen? What if half of it melts? Population growth, same thing. Estimates of the global carrying capacity are 10 to 11 billion. So does that mean that when we get to 10 to 11 billion, really bad things happen? What about 8 billion? What about 9 billion? What if we overshoot and we get to 14 billion? Have we reached our tipping point or not? Um, again, kind of a, a fuzzy number, but hopefully a clear idea. Um, so the three big ideas, uh, again, are there is no way. You can't throw things away. Uh, you can't get something for nothing, and you can't break even. Um, so uh, there is no way. You, you can't get rid of matter. You can't destroy matter. You can only convert it to one thing or another. You can't get something for nothing. That's our laws of, of uh, conservation of mass and conservation of energy. You can't create something. You gotta spend something. You gotta spend money to make money. And then you can't break even. That's that entropy law uh, that says that as we convert things, we lose efficiency. So that's chapter two.